All right, welcome everybody to today's webinar by ISIS, the International Solar Energy Society. And we are very pleased that today we are presenting a webinar on solar in South Africa. And we're going to get started right away. So first off, I want to give you a short introduction in, into ISIS and the work we do. So ISIS is a UN accredited membership NGO and we've been accredited with the UN since 1992. And we have individual and corporate and institution members from countries all around the world. Our mission is 100% renewable energy for all, used efficiently and wisely. Our key activities to achieve this mission are our biannual congresses that take place internationally. One is the upcoming ISO Solar World Congress 2023, which will take place in New Delhi, India. And the next one is next year's Eurosun 2024. We also publish two key publications. One is Solar Energy, which is a quite old and well-established solar energy journal. And we just added recently the Solar Energy Advances Journal, which is a fully open access one. We also do webinars such as the one today. They are free to join and we put them on about once a month. We also have education initiatives for younger people. They also take place both online and offline. And we also try our best in sharing knowledge about uh, solar by using infographics and our solar energy museum. Now, before we get into the webinar, a quick word on the Q&A session. There will be time for your questions towards the end of the webinar. We will first go through all the presentations by the individual speakers, and then we will have a joint Q&A session at the end. What you can do in the meantime is send in your questions, and you can do that by using the chat box. If you are sending in a question, please keep the question short and precise to make it easier for us to assort the question to the corresponding author. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce the moderator of today, Monica Olefren from Australia. And it is definitely a great, great pleasure. Monica has been the ISIS president in the past, and she's been so supportive of ISIS and the work that we do. So it's always great to have her back. Monica co-initiated this um, webinar, and so I'm pleased to hand over for Monica to take the stage. Thank you, Arabella. It is really good to be with you today as moderator for this webinar on the topic, The Sun, a Double-Barreled Energy Source. How are we utilizing this in South Africa? There's no doubt that Southern Africa has an abundance of sun and solar, and that solar is getting cheaper and cheaper, but still there is unfortunately an overabundance also of fossil fuels in both the energy and electricity mix. Today, we have three great speakers who will discuss not only the electricity situation in South Africa, but also solar thermal initiatives in Southern Africa, its uses, demonstration and training programs, and contribution to energy security through the Sol Train program, with some history mixed in. I will not read out each speaker's CV, these are online for you to read, but I'll give a brief introduction and try to maximize uh, presenter's speaking time. So firstly, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Karen Surridge, Project Manager for Renewable Energy and Cleaner Fossil Fuels in Samidi, the South African National Development Institute. She has been successfully piloting sustainable energy and efficiency solutions to lower the country's greenhouse gas emissions and support a just, solar en just energy transition. I've got to know uh, Karen just recently through the IEA's uh, uh, past president, Ken Guthrie, who introduced me to her when I was looking to discuss with someone how to extend the life of water heaters in areas of poor water quality. A um, mundane but important issue for which she has practical knowledge. Karen will present an overview of the electricity situation in South Africa, and if time allows, give a double-barreled approach of solar in the country, its general use, and its measure of energy security. Please start, Karen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica, for that introduction. I do appreciate it. Um, 
I will be sharing my presentation screen. I'm hoping that you can see it at the moment. Yes, Is it visible? You see the screen. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, um, okay, now we lost it. Hold on. Oh. It looks like we lost Karen completely. Okay, in that case, I would then suggest, Monica, um, that we actually start with the second presentation, which is held by Wolfgang. Oh, good. Well, I now have the pleasure of introducing Wolfgang gruber Glatzel who has worked for 10 years at the Austrian Institute for Sustainable Technologies, AEE in Tech, in the field of renewable tech energies for industrial systems. He will be talking about the award-winning program, SOLTRAN, the Southern Africa Solar Thermal Training and Demonstration Initiative that has been successfully built up in the last 12 years. Oh, we have... Karen back. Yeah, we've Shall we back. Yes, my apologies. Apparently the solar energy didn't kick in fast enough. <laughs> so we go back to Karen. But I'm back yes. if you still want me to set the scene. <laughs> yes, yes, hold on. Okay. Trying again. Thank you. Sorry about that. It just dropped connection, but I think we're back. Yeah. yeah. All righty. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's move forward. For those who are not aware of Sanedi and, and who we are and what we do, you can see us as a implementing and research arm of the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy in South Africa. You can see outlined in the green box there our main focus areas, but essentially all of this talks to working across the energy sector, except in nuclear, and our main mandate is to drive energy efficiency, energy security through innovation and technology piloting and demonstration towards informing energy policy in the country. Now, South Africa is, um, has, has a couple of dubious um, honours here. Is we're responsible for almost 2% of the greenhouse gas emissions um, globally. We are the highest emitter in Africa and we're in the top 20 emitters per capita worldwide, uh, which then places us, and, and most of this is attributed to uh, being the, having the largest point source of carbon dioxide emissions in the world, um, being situated just outside the Gauteng province in Mpumalanga. Um, the impact of all of this and, and the impact into the future is something that is often, I think, neglected in terms of the everyday person, the layman in the street um, who thinks, well, you know, electricity production, how can that possibly be impacting on me? But the overall impact on the economy of the country, so if we look at things like the uptake of uh, manufactured goods in our overseas markets, our packaging and, and the carbon um, content thereof, the tax costs that come with this, and of course the new CBAM that's just come into, um, into play. What ends up happening is that as we have to adapt to reducing our carbon emissions, um, we have an impact on industry with things like stranded assets being left behind. We have a result on our electricity price. Um, this affects everybody. And then, of course, the international competition. So if everything is becoming more expensive, how do we compete internationally? Now, the title of this webinar is, is looking at solar, but let's have a look at energy as a whole for a start. So we only have three types of energy available to us on planet Earth. We have our fossil fuels. You see them there depicted as coal, oil and gas, our renewable energies and, of course, nuclear energy. Now, of those three sources of energy, how do we use them? Do we have them available to us? And what is our plan for having a sustainable low carbon future? Now in 2019, the South African Department of Energy, now known as the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, produced the IRP, the Integrated Resource Plan for um, South Africa. And what this does is it looks at our energy resources and it says, well, how are we going to use these into the future? 
And this is what we all thought was going to happen because this is how we operated in the past in South Africa. All of our electricity comes from coal, or 90% of it at least, with a little bit of nuclear thrown into the mix in the form of our single nuclear station down in the Western Cape. However, we have multiple other energy sources available in South Africa. So at the moment, our houses pretty much look like this. They're being coal-fired. Um, but what we would need to move towards is a more sustainable future. We have a little bit of nuclear in the mix, as I said, in terms of our Kuburg power station, and we do have some gas that's going to be coming into the mix. So in addition to that, we need to take into account that we have significant renewable energy resources, and shortly I'll show you what those resources look like in terms of quantification. But our main focus is on wind and solar into the integrated resource plan because we have excellent resource in both of those spaces and it's something that is commercially available at grid scale that can be plugged in and used. So let's have a look at electricity in South Africa and I'm sure many of you and those in South Africa as well as those overseas are aware that we are in an electricity constrained environment at the moment in South Africa. We are having load shedding and we are having electricity um, interruptions and crises and other knock-on effects of the hardware being deprived of electricity in the country. You can see here a pie chart of our gigawatt of installed capacity and the breakdown of the different energy sources there. Um, if you have a look, our electricity supply is consisting mainly of diesel, which is being burned through our open cycle gas turbines, essentially as peakers to be able to get us through those difficult times. We have a bit of renewables, hydro and nuclear in the mix, but still what you're seeing there is mainly coal. Now, this is what the picture looks like at the moment. The picture by 2030 is supposed to look like this where we have reduced our reliance on coal and brought in uh, other energy sources into the mix. You can see them listed here. And ideally, we need to move to the scenario for a number of reasons. The first one, of course, being that we need to meet our international commitments to reduction in carbon dioxide emissions and our carbon footprint. But also, in terms of energy security, we need to consider how do we have a more diverse energy mix into the future to make sure that we have reliable energy to meet our demand? So if we have a look, and this is just a very generic picture that talks about electricity generation, transmission and distribution, it's important to remember that along all of these lines, there are losses. There is also a requirement by the power stations, which are mainly coal-fired, as I've said, um, to meet the demand at at the household level um, where you see there. So what we see at the moment, and if we have to average it out across South Africa, is that for every kilogram of coal being burnt in a coal-fired power station, only about 200 grams of that energy comes through and um, is realized at household level. So we have to start moving towards a more sustainable future. In addition to this, we also need to consider that our ESCOM generation fleet of coal-fired power stations is aging. If you have a look there, the median line or the line of the average age of our power stations is 40 years. So a lot of our power stations are kept running, but what does that mean? It means that many of them are inefficient, they require more maintenance, they are not able to be as robust in terms of ramping up and ramping down, and we end up with a lot more breakdowns and a lot more cost and maintenance. So it's important to remember that although we're heavily reliant on coal, our fleet of coal-fired power stations is taking strain. We've got a lot of old timers there, you can see over 50 years. So as we push towards the transition of including other energy resources into our mix, we need to consider how we will move there in a just manner. So how do we transition from mainly coal across to that sustainable pie chart mix that you saw um, reflected in the integrated resource plan for 2019? This is just a slide that I pulled out of um, our Stats SA, which is our statistical department in South Africa that looks at the amount of electricity that we have produced. And you can see here that um, we were having less electricity produced in 2021 than in 2004. However, our population and our economy is growing. 
this slide I always like to show in the presentations, and, and this is an up-to-date up one. I think it's last week's details at week 31 there. And you can see that our ESCOM energy availability factor, ESCOM being our main power utility or electric, electricity utility in South Africa, you can see year on year is starting to drop. Which mean, What does this mean? It means that we have less energy available at any given time. And you can see there with the median lines as well, each year it's going a little lower and a little lower, although it seems to follow the same kind of trends. So ideally what we want to see is this energy availability factor being well above 70, never mind, well, 80, but, but 70 would be good. So where we're sitting at the moment in the mid to high 50s is really not conducive to meeting our requirements. So how do we boost this? This I also like to show, this is an annual outlook, but essentially everything, you don't have to read this, it's really tiny, but everything in red on a week by week basis between March 2023 and March 2024, so our financial year, you can see there that the likely scenario is that we will have at least two gigawatts that we will need to load shed over each week. And this is why South Africa is sitting in a constant state of load shedding for the last while. Because of the, fact, the factors that we've just spoken about in terms of our aging power stations and the requirements of those, but also in terms of our unplanned and planned maintenance and outages that are taking place. So it looks like at least until the end of the financial year, which for us is end of March next year, we will still be experiencing load shedding of at least level two or higher. What I thought I would just show with this slide is the installed power production plants, let's put it that way, because um, what we haven't discussed, and I don't want to go into too much detail with limited time, is that um, ESCOM being our electricity utility in South Africa is able to procure and buy electricity from independent power producers through a program that is run by our government department. And what you can see here is the different sources of that energy and where they are geographically in the country with the main power lines. So moving on to renewable energy, we said that what we want to see is far more renewables coming into the mix, which would reduce our carbon footprint and increase our energy security if it is brought online in a responsible manner that integrates into our current energy and electricity supply. So what does South Africa have available that we can relatively easily use? And I mentioned earlier that our focus of our integrated resource plan is mainly solar and wind. We do also have a bit of biomass. Whereabouts is this? Well, as you can see here, if we look at a map of South Africa, um, we have excellent solar resource across the entire country, in fact. Um, we have what you see on the East Coast there is still very conducive to using solar energy. Um, both in the form of heat and light, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But most of our solar farms, you will have seen on the previous map, where they're looking at concentrated solar as well as photovoltaics, are sitting in the Northern Cape province, and that's that lovely deep red area that you're seeing there. So we really do have a lot of solar resource that we can use um, for electricity production and energy provision in the country. Then if we have a look at the wind map of South Africa, by the way, these resource maps are, are, are housed and managed through Senedi. Um, you see here in the dark red zones that we have an excellent wind resource along most of our coastal regions and inland. Um, so it's important to remember that geographically spread, we, where you're seeing less wind is actually where we have a lot of solar. Um, and then, of course, we have this wind along the, along the coastlines. And finally, if we start to look at biomass concentration, now in South Africa, we don't um, grow crops for biomass production or for electricity and energy production, but we do have waste from agriculture and so forth that we can use um, for energy production in the country. Now, as at 2018, these are the renewable energy plants that have been put uh, in place from our independent power producers that are supplying electricity to the grid. I'll let you have a look at this map since the presentation is available at your leisure, but you'll see there, particularly where the solar resources, of course, there's a lot of PV and CSP, and then our wind resource being very visible along the coastline. So what about technology? Now we have all this great resource. It's nice to have resource and it's free, yes, but we need technology. So if we consider solar, and this is really what our discussion today is about, is how are we going to utilize that solar to support the ele electricity as well as energy requirements of the country? 
Now we're really lucky because the sun, and we have a lot of sun here in South Africa, is actually a double-barreled resource. It gives us two forms of energy. It gives us heat and light. So what happens is we can use heat directly for solar heating or cooling, and we can use the light directly in PV for electricity. You can also, however, use the heat to generate electricity using um, power plants such as the concentrated solar powers that we have in the Northern Cape in South Africa. So if we're going to use heat directly, and my two co-speakers are going to show you a lot more and very exciting projects that we've all been working on over the years in South Africa, focusing on the heat component, but how do we utilize it? So firstly, the no-brainer and the really easy one straight out of the box is solar water heating for your house. Um, so of course, if you, if you look at your household's electricity consumption, your geyser, which is electrical in most cases in South Africa, there's a big shift towards solar water heating, but we're not there yet. It's using about 50% of your electricity. Now imagine if we could remove that demand from our electrical grid. We would make a significant contribution towards reducing load shedding. And of course, the knock-on effect of reduced electricity consumption means reduced carbon footprint and carbon dioxide emissions. This, I'm sure, will be shown to you by the two speakers that will follow me, but this is one of the projects that we were involved in. This is a small and first district heating system in South Africa. So here we're looking at hot water for, uh, in this case, student residences. There are 14 buildings that are connected by a two and a half kilometer long uh, insulated pipeline that has a full district heating system using gas as a backup energy source. Um, and this has really been a most successful project, and it's piloted large-scale district heating technology in this country, in South Africa. But what about electricity? We can also use the sun's light for electricity production, of course. So there's, of course, our solar PV. Now you see there's some lovely solar farms, but we can really scale this technology. Solar PV is a technology that can go from massive scale that we see up in the left-hand corner there, grid scale, down to pocket-sized, which is what you see in the bottom right here, um, which is, I actually have one of these, it's a little um, radio and, and communication device along with charging your cell phone, all sorts of things. In between, you see it at household scale and even at e-mobility scale. Um, we have the solar car race that takes place in South Africa each year. So it's really a technology that's scalable and that can be utilized for a variety of um, technology applications to provide electricity. And then of course we have concentrated solar. I don't think I need to explain to anyone on the webinar how concentrated solar works, but essentially we have a number of the technologies down here in South Africa, ranging from the power tower to the um, trough technologies. Uh, in mo uh, and they're all in the Northern Cape province that are online. But if we are going to go solar, so we are going to use the sun's heat directly, and then we are going to produce electricity from the sun. If we're gonna be using all that energy, what we need to do is become energy efficient first, because then we can size our technologies to fit our electricity requirement or our energy requirement. Remember how I said the resources are free? The technology is not. So if we are going to be putting down our technologies, let's first go energy efficient. So I'm sure I don't need to define this, but basically energy efficiency is being able to use a reduced amount of energy to still get the same result in whatever it is that you are doing. Energy efficient buildings, of course, and particularly when you look at households, um, if you're looking at things like thermal comfort um, and providing uh, uh, the electricity as well as heating requirements for the building, it's important to remember that you can use less energy, which will bring down your costs, becoming cheaper to operate and produce fewer greenhouse gases into the environment. So this is sort of my, um, shall we say, first approach to how we go energy efficient. We need to change our mindset. So what we need to do is walk around and go, well, what is using electricity? Then we need to affect a behavior change. So we need to consider, do I really need to be using that electricity at the moment? And finally, we need to take action to become energy efficient. So things like switching off lights if you're not in the room, 
um, you, switching uh, or unplugging chargers and switching off standby devices. And I know um, in South Africa, most of us, because electricity has been relatively cheap and easily available for a long time, we don't think about walking out of the room and switching off the light when we leave. So these are things that one just really has to make a mindset change towards. But before we start then sizing all sorts of technologies for electrical interventions, there are a number of smaller interventions that we can put into place that will really reduce our demand or our need, therefore reducing our demand on the grid, helping the grid to have um, more stability, less load shedding, and of course, for us, saving costs in the pocket if you're not having to pay up so much for electricity. But one of the important things that I want to point out here in terms of um, the solar resource is before we go putting PV on the roof, first step out of the gates, I always say, is put up a solar water heater. In South Africa, we have brilliant solar resource. You've seen the map. It doesn't matter where you live in the country, you will get hot water from the sun. It will work for you. It will reduce your electricity bill significantly and it will reduce your carbon footprint significantly. And then there's a number of other interventions that you see listed here with a sort of an estimated electrical saving that you see in that space. Once you've managed to affect most of these, then you can look at sizing a photovoltaic system with possibly a battery backup to make sure that you're energy secure, particularly in this time where we have load shedding and we have hours per day where you might not have electricity available to you, but you might need it. Photovoltaics are relatively cheap nowadays, considering that the technology has been around and been being developed for decades but batteries are still rather expensive. So it really behoves the, the homeowner, building owner, or tech owner, prospective tech owner, to look at going energy efficient first so that you have a smaller system that's gonna cost you a little bit less to put into place so that you'll be able to have photovoltaics which give you electricity with a battery backup that will take you through the night. And so that you can be relatively uh, I, I don't like the word off-grid because I don't think it's a good idea for anyone to go off-grid. It's not good for you and it's not good for the municipality or the, or the, the, the grid itself. But it's um, one of the things that one needs to consider in terms of becoming energy secure. So essentially the grid, you remain connected to it, you still utilize a bit from the grid, but you make sure that you're as energy efficient as possible and that when the grid is not supplying, you have a secure supply of electricity in your house. And on that note, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. I'm conscious of time, so I'm happy to take questions afterwards. My apologies for the glitch in the beginning of the seminar. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. That was a really comprehensive uh, uh, talk on the situation in South Africa. And it would be fascinating to uh, see how quickly the aging coal-fired power stations are replaced and with what. A great talk. And I will move on quickly to um, our next speaker. Uh, and uh, having given a, a, a brief beginning uh, introduction to Wolfgang, I will just continue on to say that he will be talking about Soltran which uh, was built up in the last 12 years and developed in Austria under the direction of Werner Weiss, well known to many of you and often referred to as the father of Soul Train. Werner is now enjoying uh, his well-earned retirement, but Wolfgang, however, has an intimate knowledge of the program through his expertise in energy efficiency, excess heat and solar process heat, which he has acquired in projects in Europe, Asia, and Africa. And he will now talk to us on Soltran. Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you, Monica, for the nice introduction. I will now share my screen. All right, so I'm happy to give you now an introduction to the Soltran initiative and specifically to the Soltram Plus project. Um, AEE Intec is well known to many of the uh, viewers today. 
It's an Austrian Institute for Sustainable Technologies. Werner Weiss has been mentioned before. He not only initiated the Soul Train project, but, uh, but also founded together with other colleagues at our institute. And I'm happy to be part of this uh, institute for 11 years now, uh, being uh, focusing mainly on industries, producing industries, energy efficiency there, uh, specifically also the integration of solar process heat, or also technologies like heat pumps to provide the thermal demand of industries. Um, a short introduction uh, add-on from, from my side, uh, but I want to continue with the Soltram project. I hope you don't see the small part on the left side. It's all right, we're seeing the full screen. Do you see it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, then, uh, well, the Soldrum Plus project, it's actually the fifth phase of uh, yeah, the Soul Train initiative, as we like to say. It has been started in 2009 with the first phase uh, in some uh, Southern African countries. All phases have been founded by the Austrian Development Agency. You see a nice picture, a nice artwork of our partner, PBCDC in Lesotho. Uh, where they build, for example, solar cookers, as you see in the background here, um, one of many uh, partners in the in the project. Um, just some details um, about this particular Solgram Plus project. It has been started in January this year and will last for four years until the end of 2026. We have 10 partners uh, with the logos uh, seen, being seen here, Sanedi uh, with Karen, as the last speaker um, you, you just have heard uh, is, is one partner of it, uh, also the University of Stellenbosch, second South Africa partner, but also partners from Botswana, Lesotho, Namibia, uh, and Zimbabwe. Um, I want to add that we have also, uh, Mozambique was a, a partner in, in the previous phases, uh, but not in Soldrum Plus project, but within the Soldrum Plus project, we have installed an outreach to the whole SADC region, so also other countries beyond those six countries, um, giving uh, yeah, uh, the possibility to expand and utilize the results and the learnings from the Soltram project also beyond th this regional scope. Uh, Soltram so far, just a brief overview as Dieter, the next speaker, will talk about a bit more from his experience, as he was also part of the the Soul Train initiative from the beginning, but just some numbers. Uh, what Soul Train is about, uh, as the name says, says is Soul Train. It's about training in solar, specifically on solar thermal. It's about training and it's about demonstration that this technology uh, is, uh, yeah, is feasible, can be installed in different kind of applications, and that we can learn from from them. Can go with study groups, as we can see here, uh, to those demonstration sites and, and see they are working, they are functioning, and we can replace our electricity dependency with, with that. So far, at the end of 2022, 5,000 people have been trained in more than 200 training courses in the six partner countries. Uh, more than 600 demonstration systems have been installed again, to show and demonstrate the applicability and feasibility of solar thermal technologies. In total, we have almost 7,000 square meters of installed capacity of a, with an installed thermal capacity of around 5 megawatt. Uh, a nice overview of uh, from the different countries. Uh, you see this 7,000 square meter, uh, and you have seen the very good solar resources in um, in Southern Africa, so that leads to almost uh, more, uh, more than 5 million kilowatt hours or 5 gigawatt hours of solar yield, leading to these electricity savings and to avoided costs uh, each year. When the systems are running, not only of costs, but also very important of CO2 reduction uh, as we yeah, reduce the electricity consumption from the coal-dominated uh, coal electricity grid in uh, not only South Africa, uh, but also in, 
between other countries. The salt drain focal area, so what is salt drain about? It is about mainly draining, so that we uh, drain people, different target groups to uh, being able to install new system, to maintain them, to operate them, uh, but also a lot of awareness raising to um, politicians, uh, stakeholders, that solar can help in reducing the dependency on the electricity grid, but also about financial incentives, demonstration projects I've sent, said before, but also helping uh, regulations to um, yeah, allow the inst installment of these systems and also some small R&D initiatives. For example, we currently have a project ongoing where we compare uh, different solar thermal technologies, but also PV to heat. So PV directly used as a as for heat and not electricity, which is quite simple and maybe may also a solution in some uh, aspects. So currently at the university in Windhoek, we are setting up a small R&D project within SolTrain. SolTrain Plus. Uh, so those who know SolTrain might wonder what SolTrain Plus is about. So in this current project, uh, the Plus refers not only to yeah, the extended uh, timeline and uh, extended phase of the project, but also that we in, uh, go beyond solar a bit and also go to renewable heating and cooling. So we include heat pump in the trainings, uh, but also in the in the demonstration. So we do fund fund projects that combine solar heat with heat pumps to have higher shares of renewable heating. And similarly, what Karen already said, energy efficiency is the first fuel. So looking at energy efficiency also in the projects, this is uh, what we have done in previous. Uh, courses in Malaysia and Egypt before uh, doing trainings, energy efficiency first uh, in industries, but also in other applications using uh, especially heat recovery as a main uh, yeah, possibility to add to, uh, yeah, to, to cover the thermal demand of uh, different, um, yeah, different places. Uh, a strong focus is also on train the trainer to make sure that um, yeah we train people that can do again similar trainings in VTCs at universities and other areas building up uh, their own private training courses too. So that's very important uh, that we have a sustainable uh, initiative and that's not re uh, reliant only on the funding of the Austrian Development Agency, but that the benefits go beyond the project scope. Uh, I don't want to bore you with the work package structure, just showing that with the different um, aspects, we try to target different groups and beneficiaries. Uh, I want to highlight again the, the training, the capacity building, especially for VTC's industry, that uh, we do fund the demonstration projects, but we also do monitoring and quality management. So each system we do fund with our demonstration budget, will be also, uh, uh, there will be a quality check one year after in installation and for some um, designated systems also a, a remote monitoring will be uh, installed in order to measure uh, the solar yield and to learn from those, um, yeah, from those systems to include this again in the training courses. A very important and strong focus is with a designated work package on gender and diversity management to empower women in clean tech and uh, beyond the, beside the, 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 I would say normal dissemination and awareness raising activities, we have uh, the work package in utilization and expansion. What we mean here is that we have an outreach to the SADC region. So uh, not only the five countries we have mentioned, but also other countries um, for example, we have already set up a meeting with Zambia, uh, a VTC of Zambia, where they cooperate with uh, the University of Windhoek, that their uh, training activities are combined and the learning from SolTrain can be done. I also want to highlight that in previous phases, AEE Intech was responsible in managing the whole project. 
but in this phase we want to uh, share our the responsibility in order for Sacri, one partner, to take over more of the responsibility in, in the later work packages. Uh, the reason is also that uh, more responsibility should, uh, yeah, uh, Sacri is a is a, is um, is the center for renewable energy and energy efficiency in the uh, SADC region, so in the Southern African countries from Congo down to South Africa. So uh, on the one hand, we have the they are yeah in many countries active. Uh, they also have close relations to UNIDO and other stakeholders in this area. And um, yeah, if for example there's no ongoing project, no phase six, we have one partner together with all the other core partners in the project that have some sustainability of the training initiatives of the Soul Train uh, project. And by installing this, this lead, we hope that there will be a continuation of um, this work. Yeah, the Soldier in Initiative is still growing. Um, uh, in November 2020, uh, 2022, we had our Soldier Conference at the Lord Charles Hotel in Somerset West, in Southern Africa, in, in near Cape Town. And the next Soldier Conference, uh, where I want to invite all those who are interested, uh, the next Soldier Conference will be in Windhoek in Namibia and at the 20th. 22nd and 23rd of November 2023. On the first day, there will be a technical tour to three applications uh, in and around Windhoek. And on the second day, there's a conference program with speakers from Southern Africa on Soul Train project and beyond, uh, which is, yeah, the program is already quite. Uh, put it together and it's quite interesting and I invite you to uh, pre-register on our Soltrain website. Uh, I share the link at the end of the presentation too. Yeah, just some um, um, yeah, pictures and indications from previous phases. Uh, the Soltrain initiative has been awarded by the International Energy Agency by the Solar Heating and Cooling Program. It is uh, with the project in Ausenkehr in, in Namibia also, Salt Square and the University of Namibia. You see also Werner Weiss in the picture. Training on the job is very important. Uh, doing uh, yeah, hands-on training on, at the solar trailers, for example, you see on the right picture, or at the applications at the universities, VTCs and so on, so students can learn, uh, uh, really uh, get a feeling for the technology and uh, yeah, work with that. We have different kind of applications. You've seen one picture uh, by Karen at the student home in, in, in Southern Africa. This is uh, again, a hospital, a large hospital with solar collectors. This is an industry with solar collectors, but also typically smaller systems at schools or private households or housing projects, I should say. In the Soldier and Plus project, we have already, I can say, uh, quite interesting and, and, and uh, what we really like to see, new applications for demonstration funding. Um, so that's not yet installed, but the application we have already received, application for the funding, uh, I should say, uh, that includes a wide spread of different kind of technologies. For example, PVT, which is uh, photovoltaic uh, and combined with thermal. So both electricity and heat can be utilized by the, those collectors. So there's one uh, high hope also for solar technologies, PVT collectors in applications as hospitals and hotels where we can use then both electricity and hot water for the demand. We have three of those applications are also with heat pump as a backup, uh, having better efficiency in the use of electricity by the factor two, three or four. Uh, and also one application with heat recovery, which is also the focal area. And of course, solar collect area, flat plate collectors or solar geysers of uh, 1,200 square meter already in application. So we see the um, Solden initiative is going on uh, well, and yeah, we hope to see soon those um, inst um, implementations in reality. The Solden, um, 
demonstration, uh, the technology scope has been extended, as I said before. It's not only solar thermal, but also heat pumps and heat recovery. The application process uh, is important that uh, only those can apply who have already attended courses, uh, solar train courses, so we can ensure that have been trained by us or our partners to, to be sure that yeah they've received the, the expertise in order to install such a system. Uh, it's an uh, application form that can be downloaded or soon it will be online on our website as an online form. Um, yeah, we have up to 50% of funding, but uh, it depends highly on the type of um, application so if you yeah yeah and also the, of the applicant also of the size and the degree of innovation so there are different factors that influence the the funding rate to that yeah? so for example if you're a large uh, uh, international industry uh, and want to install a simple but large system the funding rate will be quite low as we don't want to have repetition and uh, yeah, we want to rather see new types of technology to demonstrate also other applications as we've seen a wide variety of possible solar technologies. Um, yeah, and we also want to fund yeah, applicants that actually really need uh, demonstration funding. The quality is very important. There will be a on site visit after one year by us or our partners and uh, remote monitoring in some of the installations. Uh, to support the project pipeline, especially for larger systems, uh, we want to uh, sorry, uh, attract more clients from uh, focal areas as industry, hospitals, tourism, social housing projects. There will be ongoing awareness raising events to get also those um, yeah, focal areas to our trainings and have trained experts that can not only do the sizing and designing of solar systems, but that they are also proficient in energy assessment and energy efficiency. Um, Pre-feasibility reports as a pre-check, uh, especially for industry, it's not always applicable, but in some cases it it's, has high potentials. So as a pre-feasibility to make sure uh, we have the right cases and then again, the demonstration funding. We have done already six trainings, three times train the trainer courses in three countries and three trainings for uh, energy efficiency and energy ass assessments for industry and commerce in three countries. Uh, we also have our ongoing activities in the six months for dissemination activities. Uh, also our gender and diversity plan is going on well with a questionnaire being sent out with more than 100 uh, yeah, feedback forms received and we already updated the application procedure for the new technological scope and also uh, new requirements. Uh, the SolTran website also have been updated. You will see instructional videos. You will see the all our demonstration systems online and the website will be also further developed to be an online a platform knowledge platform uh, with online trainings and so on being being linked to or included. Um, yeah, that being said, I uh, want to thank you for your attention. Just a brief overview of the Soul Train Plus project. Visit our website for more information. And uh, if you're interested, again, please also register or pre-register for our conference in Windhoek. Uh, you see the link here or you can go to a website. Uh, thank you for your attention and looking forward to the Q&A sessions in, in the end of the webinar. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Wolfgang. It was a really good uh, review. And Soltain is a great initiative and demonstrates the importance of education, training and monitoring to bring into practice new technologies for widespread uh, use and I was glad to see that uh, women are involved in the training as well. Solar thermal is often the poor relative of uh, uh, PV and Soltrain 
definitely shows the great value of uh, solar thermal and initiative. So thank you again. Thank and you, now, Monica. thank you. I now will introduce my longtime good friend, Emeritus Professor Dieter Holm, who is Head of Research and Postgraduate Studies at the Division of Environmental Design and Management, University of Pretoria. We were for many years together on the ISIS board, and he was always a source of wisdom, knowledge, and common sense. He has a background in architecture, and I have visited his home, built in 1974, that is the first modern home in South Africa, running exclusively on solar energy and actually off grid. Many have learned how to build solar and water efficient homes by visiting his place. He has been a long time teacher and proponent of solar energy. Even his son has a solar business. So I know of no one better to discuss lessons learned about solar thermal in Southern Africa. Thank you, Dieter. All right, Dieter, we will need you to turn on your microphone and to share your screen. I see the screen. I can't hear you yet. Let's see. Now I should be able to hear you. Okay. Is it coming on? Yes. Yes. Hi, Dieter. There we are. Uh, can you see the um, Can you see the image? Yes, we can see the screen. You just need to navigate to the PowerPoint. Yes, and now I see the PowerPoint. And if you could put it on the full screen mode, that would be awesome. Yeah. Um, you can either hit F5 on your keyboard. Yes, almost there. Or I can on the very, yeah, 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 there we go. Yes, perfect, thank you. There you are. Um, First of all, thank you very much. Uh, uh, really, that was a flattering introduction. I uh, was getting nervous about it, but I also would uh, make a compliment to the previous two presentations and speakers. It was really excellent. I, I must say, yeah, I got carried away. Good. Then, as an introduction, uh, uh, I think it's always good to remember with all the resources we have available, what is the real demand at the end? And that is overwhelmingly, it is thermal, uh, it is heating and cooling. And as um, has already been pointed out, the sun really provides us uh, uh, an ideal resource for that. Next comes transport. And the very last one is electricity or final energy. If we talk about energy, the man on the street and the woman on the street, of course, as well, so, uh, is inclined to think in terms of electricity, um, which is not always right. So let's look at a few of the soul train outcomes. And uh, mine is focused on what, what have they done right? And one of the first uh, issues here is that Soltrain, the, the program has been uh, extended many times. It started in 2009, which is a long time ago, and the success really led to various and repeated requests. Can we go on, please? Can we go on? Can we continue? That it, It's working so well. Then, <clears throat> important. It has always consistently overachieved on its targets, and that despite uh, COVID. And please remember that uh, these targets were already quite ambitious. So it is it's really a, a, an achievement to see that. Um, the next one is it is has one risk. The, international recognition. Wolfgang mentioned these briefly. Uh, more than once uh, uh, it has been assessed and um, awarded um, 
awards by independent bodies, so it's not an, an inside job or something. And that brings us to the conclusion that Soltrain must do something right. There's, uh, the, there's lessons to be learned, whether you do it on TV or on um, solar water heating or whatever program, this has uh, really been, they must know some success formula. And so I'd like to share with you the key lessons, not you can't read everything, but uh, really the core issues and I'll outline them quickly for you. It's built on uh, experience of international solar water heater leaders. That means the champions in the world. Uh, the approach is not a single one, not placing, you know, for instance, um, uh, subsidy into the market or a single track uh, idea, but um, it, we'll come to it, it is multidimensional. Then there's a, a very strict performance focus. It's quantified and you can, as you go, you can uh, compare um, the performance to what you really undertook to do. And then uh, lastly, and maybe that's the most important, is a leader, a culture of leadership. Now these four points I'd like to discuss with you briefly in a bit more de detail. So the first one is um, built on the ex experience in, of Austria. And that, that's the interesting part now here. Austria <coughs> had a, a nuclear power station that was ready to be switched off, uh, switched on, on in 1978. Zwentendorf, which is about 30 kilometers upstream of Vienna. There they wanted to build a power station. And there were a lot of uh, demonstrations against it, uh, especially the use, really large scale demos. And um, what happened next, and this is the in in interesting thing, the self same people who were active in the demos, and the demo can be quite destructive, decided, no, no, we have decided against this, but what's the alternative? And this is what I find so inspiring. So these young people, and a lot of teachers were amongst them, said, no, 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 we must now go for solar thermal. And they started the grassroots movement where they bought the equipment to build homemade solar water heaters. And they built up the knowledge and they, you could borrow the equipment and they taught you how to do these. Uh, and you could use the tools and in this way, and this is so fascinating, they build up an industry uh, which eventually became a world leader. Now, I'd like to put this in perspective. Austria, that's 80, has only a 15th of the area and only a 15th of the South African uh, population, yet they became a world leader in this and now Vienna only receives about half of the solar uh, radiation that uh, Southern Africa would, for instance, receive. So it must sit not in the resource, but possibly uh, in, in the human uh, inventiveness, the dedication and the inspiration. So in, in just to summarize the story quickly, how did they become world leaders? Actually with a negative start, and I must share with you, the vote against the new station was 50.5%, only half a percent over, over half. And yet they took the decision, Austria took the decision, and that shows you also how far they are ahead of the rest of the world that was in 19. 78. The other important issue is the multi-dimensional approach. And I'd like to share this with you quickly. And one of the first is you can't introduce solar water heaters if the market, if the end consumer 
is not aware of it. Wolfgang Schalders is one already. I'd like to stress this awareness issue first, but that's the starting point. And you can also talk about four A's, awareness, acceptance, or even better, aspiration, then availability, and finally, affordability. That is the A issues. Of course, you need ambitious targets, and I'd like to uh, change this slightly to say inspiring targets, not only ambitious. People must be aware of and strive for them. Then, of course, uh, you need training to be able to install it. And you can see these items are all interactive. The one is dependent on the other. You won't have ambitious targets if you're not aware. You won't uh, get off the ground if there's no final uh, uh, financial sticks and carrots. Laws, uh, and laws alone are not sufficient. You also have to apply the laws. And very important, you need leadership by example, and especially in government. Government is not only uh, uh, put the laws in place, but must also demonstrate convincingly that these laws are being applied and that government itself, in its own buildings, in its own facilities, leads by example. For instance, here we have uh, the potential, I'm sorry about that one. The one back, we have the, uh, come on, where is it now? Yeah, we have government buildings, which is already almost 3 million square meters of potential. Very little of this is being uh, implemented. And these are all, for instance, all print and especially print ones, these, uh, you have a captive audience and captive users. So, so um, I, I think there's, there's a big opportunity. We also had, um, on the other side, we had um, this Marlboro installation, which is the uh, ESCOM um, rebate scheme, and it shows um, maybe um, it is important that who is really the leader of the program. It was started um, in um, 14 and was run a, a couple of years, but only achieved 5% of its target, about 12 million square meters. But now look at the orientation of these. Half of them are facing the wrong way. So it doesn't help to count square meters if they're facing the wrong place, uh, direction away from the sun. So um, it's important that whatever you install, that it's also operative and in good working condition. Um, so uh, there are two lessons in it. Is um, if you want to uh, have a program, this you must have uh, dedicated but also knowledgeable people who are not in, in conflict really with the long-term uh, focus. Performance focus, and this is interesting, um, that the projects were really quantified. You had to do this, you have to do this by that time. And it's not empty political pro uh, promises, but we'll deliver such and such working, so many square meters of working projects. Um, and these are tested. What is very important that the existing systems were tested, which really was the first thing that uh, initiated and brought in the local industry by in because that's the first time they discovered that the installations they've been making all the years didn't really work um, uh, as, as well as they have been thinking themselves and have been telling themselves and others. And one of the uh, important insights was there that the backup, the electrical backup, actually concealed the non-performance of the solar water systems. Uh, the, it is important to quantify uh, what you are achieving, whether you're offering workshops or uh, open days or demonstration projects. And then it is also um, 
while you at the executive level are measuring the quantities, you must also look at the quality at the higher level. Are we facing in the right direction? The one, uh, the quantitative one is a, uh, working at the executive level, as I said, but this here is the directorship. This is uh, quite a different level of uh, assessing. Then leadership culture. And this is an interesting thing that the, the sponsors and the people uh, implementing it are independent of the industry or any vested interest. So if you are running, for instance, if you get a uh, utility company to run a solar water heating program, uh, there's a conflict of interest because the more they install, the less li likely they are to sell the electricity. Here we have the advantage, as I said, that the Austrians and the people involved there had an, a, a long record of experience, made their own mistakes, know what to avoid, and also have been through a long development history, um, as I try to illustrate. I think it is also important that in Southern Africa, in many instances, we we do not have a long-term perspective. Part people in part blame it on a colonial history. I'm not so sure, uh, but also what's very important is a, which came with the Austrians, and I must stress it: a, a culture of maintenance. That you have you need a long-term long-term perspective and maintenance and the need for maintenance and that you can avoid it if you do a proper job in the first instance uh, is, is a crucial issue because some of the installations had by metal, uh, by metal uh, corrosion on them. A lot of them were not properly insulated or insulated uh, in such a, a way that the solar energy, the, the fierce sunshine destroyed them. So, it was very uh, a crucial uh, a cultural approach that uh, was, was brought, brought home to the participant. Then um, somebody who has a record of performance simply uh, creates uh, respect. And I, I'd like to mention, uh, for instance, uh, Rudy Moshek, Werner Weiss, of course, Tony Schwarzumuller, who is uh, retired now, and, and these people were really dedicated. And uh, you, you can uh, really slept on the job, not to, not during the day, but during the night, uh, to be early the next day. And that, I, I really think these people, with the background, I think uh, that started with this cultural move are really dedicated people and inspiring people. And that really helps also if you do a presentation and uh, with, with this background, people listen to you. Um, in spite of this and having such a proud record, um, there is a culture of listening to feedback. So if you talk to uh, these Austrian team leaders, they will listen to you and respect your local experience, your local feedback. And I think that is really another lesson to be learned. And that is my whole story. I thank you. So, thank you so much, uh, Dieter, for a very thoughtful uh, uh, presentation. And I'm really glad that you started off with the pie charts for energy instead of electricity. People often confuse the two and to get uh, uh, zero emissions in energy rather than just electricity is quite a hard ask. Also, I, I've been impressed also as well with what has happened in uh, Austria 
a country, as you said, with not so great uh, solar resources, countries like South Africa and where I live uh, in, in Australia. Um, I really like your picture of uh, solar water heaters pointing in all sorts of different directions, which shows the problems that one has to overcome. And definitely leadership is very important and uh, getting a, a, a champion in uh, uh, political power is invaluable. So I would like to now thank again our three excellent speakers. We've been very lucky today to have uh, a, a, a great group of uh, people. And I hope you take the opportunity of asking questions of these three experts. And I'll go back to you, Arabella, because I haven't looked to see if there is anything in the chat, uh, uh, questions in the chat, and please do put uh, some in. Yes, of course. So um, first I'd like to ask uh, all of us first to come back uh, to the stage, so to say. So if you could unmute your microphones and turn on your cameras so that we can see. Monica, the questions are in the questions box. And I can uh, yeah. start us off with one to yes, Karen that too. came in quite early on. Um, Karen, you showed different um, uh, sources of energy uh, in the beginning of your presentation specific to uh, South Africa. And we have a attendee who is wondering, what about offshore wind resources? You showed wind, but what about offshore wind? Um, I get asked this quite often. So my standard response in the past was always, you know, in South Africa, we have a lot of land. So we have an onshore wind resource um, with land available for building to harness that resource. So just from a financial perspective, um, it makes it makes sense as a quick win because remember we're bringing them online quite quickly in South Africa. The Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Procurement Program, it's quite a mouthful, we just call it the I, I, um, REI4P, uh, is designed to, to bring um, sort of least cost fastest build in some of the later rounds. But having said that, in fact, Senedi has initiated a study looking at the feasibility for harnessing offshore wind resource in South Africa. Um, in fact, I was on a call just before this with our, some of our researchers, because it's a study that um, we'll be launching within the next while. And then we will actually be producing a, a sort of a research, but a techno-economic feasibility study towards the end of next year that looks at what is the potential for this. So for now, I don't want to say yes, we're doing it or no, we're not doing it. What I'd like to say is we are exploring the opportunities and the potential therein and um, watch this space. We'll come back to you. Good. Um, so there are a number of questions and I just go to one. I'll go to one that is easy to get to and uh, then come back there as uh, a question to uh Dieter, can you please elaborate on your comment of conflict of interest regarding leadership culture as a means of driving renewable heating in south africa okay where do i press my button here yeah. can you hear me mm -hmm. yes okay um an obvious one is, of course, um, uh, the utility. Um, we had, a, a, in the 70s, we had a surplus of um, coal-fired uh, 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 electricity provided by coal. And there was um, not really a, a major interest in, in having uh, additional solar water heating that would take away or reduce the, the demand. And that culture in, to a certain extent has remained within uh, our uh, vertically integrated uh, power uh, utility. Um, and uh, it's understandable that uh, they would not be overly keen uh, to support uh, solar thermal which would reduce the demand and naturally reduce the income. Since then, the picture has changed. 
but um, uh, a big uh, organization that like that does not uh, not uh, have a consistent uh, policy and in, in the ex execution uh, uh, things uh, can easily go wrong it is also if you only had uh, say the industry running a project like this the local industry there would also be one uh, conflict of interest so it's important uh, to have one who would not uh, an organization leading the whole initiative that does not have a, a, a temptation even to um, uh, steer it in, in its own interests. That is really all. Um, it, and, and you have much more public support if it's quite obvious that nobody is uh, 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 tempted in a country where uh, corruption is not quite unknown. Uh, on that, thank you. And I'll now go for a question to Wolfgang, a very short one first. Is Soul Train likely to go to India? And then I'll follow up with one on solar cookers. I'll come back to you on that after you've answered the one on India. The first question, <clears throat> yes, Soul Train is going on until 2026, which is a long time. It's four years. Uh, and uh, like in all phases uh, at Dr. Fiano, we always planned that it will end after the, the first phase and the second phase and the third phase and so on, because you never know. Uh, it's, it's a new project that needs funding and agreement to the funding. So we always plan for four years uh, and we do again like this. We take a lot of actions to uh, uh, Allow, yeah, have a sustainable initiative in Soul Train, even if there's no funding by the Austrian Development Agency afterwards, which is very important, I think. But uh, yeah, might be a six phase is also not out of the question. Yeah, but we plan like it would be the last one. Yeah. Ah, and I see that the question on uh, Soul Cookers has already been answered by, which will go to an email uh, for you. It was about details of. Uh, a conference. So I'll go to a, a question that I don't know who would like to ask, answer, but given that PV efficiency uh, ap approaches 25% and uh, uh, a solar boosted heat pump, uh, well, a, a heat pump has a coefficient of performance of three, and if you combine it with uh, PV, would it be better and cheaper than solar thermal to use a solar boosted heat pump? Who would like to answer that? Come on, welcome. Yeah, I can I can take the first answer, and you can both of you can jump in. Uh, yes, I mean we can see this in in reality that heat pumps. Uh, have a lot of installations and PV, of course, also. And the combination of the, those two uh, makes sense because they are also flexible uh, and modular in its approach. Uh, and uh, PV efficiency is getting better. Uh, the COP, the efficiency of, of heat pumps, is highly depending on the, on the source temperature, which is part of our training. And we learn, we include this in our training because it's, it's important to look at the combinations. Um, but um, solar thermal has still many yeah, areas where it can be applied. I think that PVT is important, so the combination of photovoltaics and, and thermal technology in one collector, which is very important for areas where there are space constraints. For example, multi-story buildings of, like hospitals, I think that's a very nice application where PVT should be installed the thermal part for hot water and electricity for, uh, for example, the heat pump, but also other electricity uh, demands in the in the building. So it um, and other other areas like industry where where my field of expertise is, 
the, you have higher temperatures and then the efficiency is also depending in, in of the heat pump and the solar collectors also depend on, on the efficient on the target temperature so it's a case-by-case -case study also in, in this regard yeah but um, in the end I've, we need to keep that big picture in, in place and this is the the renewables need to be uh, yeah more renewables needs to be installed and the technology there are different paths to the same goal of reducing our dependency of fossil fuels Thank you. Well, uh, there's a question for Karam, uh, and it is, uh, if uh, you're going to go for full electrification, uh, especially if space heating, why would you go to gas? That is the question. Um, so is that based on the diagram that I showed that said, um, space heating with ga get, get your space heating onto gas rather than electricity? That may be that where, where that the question comes diagram. I think yes. so. so. So essentially, remember in South Africa, we come with a history of cheap, reliable electricity. So most of our space heating is a bar electric heater or one of those ones that blows hot air. So now you can just imagine in winter, not that we have a, a significant winter to speak of, you know, in terms of if you're comparing it with somewhere like Germany, but in winter, our buildings are not built for handling winter. We, we live in a very warm climate, so it can get very cold. So people space heat usually with electricity in electricity monsters, basically. That's what the, the heaters are. They suck electricity. Some of them three, four kilowatts just in a little heater that's in your room. So rather than, remember, we don't have underfloor or central heating really. Underfloor heating would also be electrical, not hot water. So in most cases in South Africa, if you're going to switch to an easy solution for space heating, a little gas heater would be the best way um, to do it because um, it will firstly reduce your electricity supply and therefore your cost, but gas heating has lower emissions than if you're going to go with electricity for heating. Um, in fact, I'm sitting here at the moment, I'm looking across the room, I've got a gas heater standing on the other side of the room <laughs> because we've had a very cold snap here in South Africa. And um, so my choice is to switch to rather using um, uh, LPG, so, so the gas under pressure, in a, in a gas heater rather than, and I, and I have an indoor fireplace, but I mean, that causes emissions. So I'd rather go with that than using electricity or, or wood. Thank you. Uh, if I can maybe just say it's, it's based on the, the situation that we are in. So in Europe, it might not make sense, but in, in South Africa, it does for now. Um, there's a question that says, is there solar, a solar water cleaner for pools of water? I'm not sure what that means. Does someone, does can that you, resonate? Can you is read there, it again? Yeah. Is there solar water cleaner for pools of water? Is it not um, using PV for water treatment plants? That may well be. Yes. So, um, in fact, those are technologies that Sinedi is looking at piloting. And I understand there are already some of them at the municipalities around South Africa. So, if you're looking at water treatment, so fresh potable water, as well as sewage water treatment, um, of course, you need to move water around. You need energy to move water around. Um, so, things like PV pumping and PV to drive the systems is most definitely something that we look at in um, providing and in this case it's it's energy security towards water treatment because with the load shedding you know um, if you're off for four hours but you've still got sewage coming in or potable water that needs to go out um, how do you manage that so i think they're talking about a pv um, uh, intervention that will enable wastewater and potable water treatment and yes, it is it is underway. We have piloted it and Sanedi is currently piloting at municipalities. I can add maybe uh, that sorry. I can add maybe no, in ahead. terms of solar thermal in terms of solar thermal, 
there's also mm -hmm. an ongoing um, uh, task, research task of the International Energy Agency for Solar Heating and Cooling, which is, um, yeah, uh, I think many, many know. Uh, and the task 62, I believe, is about water treatment with solar uh, mm. thermal technologies using the light, not only as like Karen uh, explained nicely, we can use the, the thermal energy, but also the light in, in terms of the disinfection of the of treated water as a additional step for using water um, in sewage treatment or uh, before using in agricultural purposes or for different kind of purposes. Yeah? And I know that a colleague of mine, they are currently setting up a new task for so-called solar reactors, meaning um, yeah, the, uh, advancing these kind of technologies in new types of collective designs. Yeah. Thank you. And the next question is, is industrial process heating a priority for food and beverage? and the retrofit of commercial and industrial boilers. Sounds that like one be... Go ahead. Um, so a number of years ago, I'm just trying to think, uh, I think it was 2018, 17, 18 and 19, we did a study that looked specifically at solar heat for industrial processes, SHIP, um, and the potential in South Africa. However, the Soul Train program had already been way out in front of this. It was in 2019 that the um, large 600 square meter system, if I'm not mistaken, Wolfgang was put down at the Klang Karoo International Ostrich Tannery, which is of course for industrial processing of ostrich leather. Um, and so South Africa already had some significant um, installations that served with solar heat for industry. However, what we then did was feasibility studies of what industries would benefit most from this and how would one go about in integrating and implementing it. And what came out at the time was that uh, the solar interventions don't compete with our cheap fossil fuel electricity or energy production, let's put it that way, energy production. However, now we may be seeing a completely different picture just in terms of the impact on energy security and the electricity costs themselves that have gone up. So it might be a study that's worth revisiting. But having said that, it, it, the food and beverage industry was one of the ones that came out tops and, and textiles um, for potential interventions that would be relatively economic to do. Um, and we had a couple of pilot um, sites that had agreed to pursue this and then unfortunately the pandemic hit and a bit of a recession and unfortunately financially it wasn't viable to take take those further at the time for those companies. The study is however available um, and people can contact me. I will drop my, or oh, I see Wolfgang has already put a list here, but I'll drop my email address uh, in the chat box. And um, it was also on my presentation if people are looking to get in touch and get some of the information. I think Karen mentioned something important, and that, that is in the past, um, you know, cost comparisons were were done on the cost uh, on, of conventional electricity as against, you know, the running cost and of, of a uh, renewable installation. Now we must start thinking about the cost of uh, power that's not being supplied. In other words, the cost of um, coming in with emergency power and that is uh, and you don't know when it's going to be cut it's, uh, mm -hmm. exactly the economic impact of that and they've started quantifying it that's, is proving to be exactly. rather significant and that's i think that's right. what would exactly. yes i think there's another layer i think also karen you had it in the first slide of your presentation that um if you want to continue your business, especially if it's export oriented, you need to take care of your emission. You produce as an industry, as more and more uh, industries in the automotive, but also in other sectors are sensible in uh, on their emission, including their supply chain. So if you're a supplier in to the automotive industry, metal producing, um, metal, yeah, um, a processing industry, for example, but also food industry, uh, you are asked for your CO2 emission for your product. 
uh, if you if you're a supplier and you are suddenly in fear of your own business core so it's not um, only about cost of electricity or cost of energy or cost of uh, like Dieter mentioned uh, having no electricity for some time but rather uh, your core business because you will not be selected as a supplier in, in future because your emissions are too high so I think this will have a large impact on industries and yes there are hundreds of implementations for ship uh, as Karen has mentioned um, also especially in the food and beverage industry uh, we've uh, virtually run out of time, but I do want to ask uh, uh, this last question, uh, and uh, uh, Arabella will tell you how the following uh, any leftover questions can be answered. Uh, what is uh, someone would like to know how to become involved in participating in a Soul Train program? Sorry, okay. could you could you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, what it, uh, it, the actual words is what is involved in participation in Soul Train? I think it means how do one, does one become involved in a Soul Train yeah. program? Um, so the trainings we organize together with our partners. So example, for example, with Karen together at Sanidi that we organize them and through the channels. Uh, Sanidi and others, we had, um, yeah, make advertisements for the trainings, and you can uh, apply for the for taking part of the training, and for workshops organized by Sanidi on their own. On their own, um, and if you want uh, to participate for demonstration funding, then you can also contact Sanidi, for example, or if you're close to the Cape Town region. Uh, at University of Stellenbosch or in other countries to the respective project partners in the in the countries. Yes. Uh, do we need to uh, finish now, Arabella? Yes, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Yes. Uh, there Sorry. is one or, two, one or two more questions. How can those be answered? Um, what I can do is take the question log, which is something that I can do electronically, and I can then forward the questions to the speakers. So that's something that I can do after the webinar is closed. Well, thank you very much to everybody. A, a great uh, uh, presentations and uh, answering of questions. Thank you. And thank you, Arabella. Of course, no worries. Um, thank you also from my side to the speakers. Before we all head out, um, I want to share two more final um, announcements. And that is, yes, there is going to be a recording of the webinar and we will also have the presentations available to you online and they will be available on the ISIS homepage. Um, and lastly, something that's coming up for us here at ISIS this year, quite soon actually, um, is the ISIS Solar World Congress 2023, where solar obviously is going to be big uh, at center stage. Um, it's going to take place in New Delhi in India this year, um, end of October, early November. We have opened registration for this quite recently, and um, early bird deadline is the 25th of August. So if you want to benefit from that early bird discount, go ahead and register by August 25th. Yeah, and with that, uh, we're coming to the close of the webinar. Thank you all again for joining. Thank you to the speakers and hope to see you on a webinar really soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.